Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a helpful way. And that's that doesn't hold any intellectual credence. I mean, that's not how we treat anybody else. We should treat them with respect. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to treat people with respect, we should take their, them seriously. And if we're going to take them seriously, we should provide them with serious answers. And so that's that's uh, that's just a little background. So people can know my heart. Like a lot of this stuff, like it's because I was dissatisfied. I get where they're coming from. Yeah, I just I disagree with them. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. We're going to be dealing with a bunch of issues today, talking to a friend, a pastor out in Boulder, Colorado, Chase Davis. He is a husband and a father. Uh, He's got his degree from Denver Seminary. He's getting his PhD as well. Uh, All around great guy. He's a church planter there, and he's real boots on the ground. We're going to be talking about a number of issues that plague our culture and uh, how to solve them. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right. Welcome to the show, Chase. How you doing, brother? Great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, we connected. I saw you on John's show, and then you know, we connected uh, offline, if you will, as well. So I saw, you know, I resonated when you talked to John Harris uh, several weeks back about different things. And and that was something that, again, I, I take encouragement from, you know, seeing guys, 20s, especially in their 30s and 40s, seeing issues in the church and the culture and really trying to push against them and solve them and not just be reactionary or defensive, but going in and building. And of course, church planting is quintessential building, right? Yeah. You're there and, and trying to proclaim Christ, make much of him and um, win souls, right? And preach the word. So I uh, appreciate your efforts there. Um, you had a tweet. You're pretty active on Twitter. And we'll put that in the description uh, for everybody to go and follow if they haven't already. But um, first, before we get there, why don't you just tell us a little bit about who, who you are, and uh, we'll jump into this Twitter string from about a week or so ago. Yeah, so I'm uh, from originally from Texas, grew up Southern Baptist, was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, got saved uh, by God under the ministry of Jack Graham down at Prestonwood Baptist. My parents raised me in the church, but growing up, I always had a lot of questions, and those questions were you know, we're not met with, with answers that necessarily settled on my soul well. Mm -hmm. And as I studied the scriptures more and felt a call into ministry, I I kept asking questions and I I felt a great discontinuity between uh, kind of some of the stuff I was hearing and some of the stuff I was reading. And uh, thankfully my parents had me in a Christian school. And so I kept asking questions and really from that time of being called into ministry, I I just, I wanted to go to seminary, uh, wanted to learn. Um, That's part of the reason I'm in a PhD program is that I have uh, an appetite and a curiosity for learning, and that's a great place to go and uh, kind of get some get some learning. And it's a it's a good place to get some questions answered that maybe you can't. And so, um, so yeah, we planted a church here in 2011. Uh, I'm on the board of a local private Christian school. Got my kids going there, and and God has done some incredible things over the last, gosh, what is it, 12 years now. Uh, yeah, of us planting yeah, well. here in Boulder, we've pl- we've planted a few other churches out of our church, and so God is doing incredible things here in Boulder, and God has been really good and faithful to us. Uh, that's the one thing I always uh, thank God for. In my prayers is how how providential and how He's provided, because I know it's not anything that I've earned uh, or anything because I'm I'm so good. It's it's all grace um, what mm-hmm. He's done here. So I'm really thankful um, for what He's done and glad to be here. Uh, but yeah, my emphasis and my research is on uh, historical theology, the New England Puritans, their conceptions of theological anthropology, how that ties into their ecclesiology, and and even dabbling a bit in, in kind of their political stuff. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that comes up in my my ministry a little bit. Uh, it's more gives uh, my church enjoys it because Boulder's a very highly educated city, one of the most highly educated cities in America in terms of PhDs and that kind of thing. And so it's not uncommon for, for a lot of our people to be in a PhD program at CU Boulder or anything like that. So they enjoy the more intellectual stuff. But uh, but yeah, we've just tried to plant the most normal church in Boulder is what we always say. <laughs> we want to stand on the word of God, preach the gospel faithfully, love people, love God. And uh, it doesn't take a lot to be very normal in Boulder because you got a lot of occult activity. You've got a lot of people interested in spirituality from rocks and yoga and other things and so uh you know who we are is christian we're a christian church 
uh, non-denominational. And yeah. we're, we're really excited for what God is doing. Yeah. No, praise God. So what took you, were you in Texas and you went from Texas to Boulder? Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, if we can get into that a little bit. Uh, we were in Texas, my wife and I married while we were in college at Texas A&M and I got my degree in construction management, both as an opportunity for gainful employment, but also, uh, if I wanted to go into tent making type ministries overseas, I originally felt called to be a missionary, uh, since that was where God might be leading us. Um, we got on the phone with a missions organization. I can't remember if it was frontiers or pioneers, whichever one. And, uh, they were like, we're going to send you over to Pakistan in a few years. And I, you know, me being a young, dumb, you know, just like whatever, man, yeah. uh, I was like, okay. Meanwhile, my wife is sitting beside me crying and I was <laughs> like, I think we're not on the same page. So yeah. we needed a place to go. That was kind of a neutral place that we wanted to be and the market had crashed in 2008, 2009. So we didn't have a lot of opportunities in Texas. Her degree was in tourism and mine was in construction. And both those industries were very low at that point. Mm -hmm. And so we moved up to Gunnison, Colorado. My family had a place up there, still does. And it was a free place to live. So we could move there at least for the summer and see what the Lord might have for us. I could be a raft guide. I always wanted to try that. Oh, cool. uh, I didn't do that. I actually got a grown-up job as a project engineer <laughs> at a general <laughs> contractor with a general contractor. So we moved there, met a... Uh, Met a, met a friend uh, who I planted the church with, still here, Matt Patrick. He's great. Um, and so he was a pastor there in Gunnison. He has his own journey. I mean, you want to talk about guys being raised in two different environments. He grew up behind a bar, uh, like because his mom ran a bar. His dad was a musician. At a point, they lived in their car. Like he gr didn't grow up in the church, but got saved when he was in high school. Felt a call to plant churches. He kind of got me into that that stream of thinking, what church planting was. And, uh, and so he invited me to explore and pray about the opportunity to plant a church in Colorado with him. And he formed a core team. We did. And we were looking at opportunities in, in Colorado. And we knew we wanted to be kind of in a college town. Uh, and so there's not a lot of those in Colorado, but one of them is Boulder. Another's mm -hmm. Fort Collins. And at that time, we were connected with the Acts 29 Network. They were planting churches in Colorado, still are. And they were like, well, Boulder doesn't have an Acts 29 church. Seems to be a need there. So Matt and I visited Boulder. He had been there once before. I'd never been. I just visited and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cool town, beautiful town. Uh, you know, lots going on. Seems like a huge opportunity. I mean, there's lots of non-Christians. So why wouldn't we go where lots of non-Christians are? That's what we, we want to reach people with the gospel. Right. Yeah. And it, it wasn't, you know, some church planners have this kind of experience and whether it's true or not, that's not for necessarily me to decide, but they'll come and they'll be like, they just really felt a call from God to be in Boulder. I'm sent to Boulder. And mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say the call to Boulder was that specific for me and us, but it was just kind of like, you know, seeing how the Bible teaches, I seen how Paul went on his missionary journeys. Like he wanted to go to places where, where people were, and this is a place where people were that needed Jesus. And so we're happy to serve God in that way. Mm -hmm. And so that was the original call went through a, Matt went through a training uh, program for church planning called fellowship associates, great training program based out of little rock, Arkansas. So he got to move down to little rock for a year. And I went to the mission field for, uh, for about half a year with my wife and verified the calling that we're not supposed to be there. Um, we were not great missionaries in a Muslim <laughs> context. Like overseas, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Muslim, Muslim, okay, yeah. Muslim country, yeah, in, in Southeast Asia. And so we were over there and we came back very excited to plant. Um, planted when I was 24, started seminary at Denver Seminary the same week we started holding kind of a public service in our apartment. Um, none of that is necessarily advised. But it <laughs> it is how how God worked in my life, and yeah. uh, and so I'm very thankful for His kindness because when I look back, I don't know if I would have given me money back then, you know, to mm. so, to to, and we didn't have a lot of denominational support. We didn't have, I mean, back then Acts 29 didn't give church plants any money or anything like that. So oh, it was wow. very uh, bootstrap, you know. Just we're here if I need to get a job, you know, to be bivocational or something, I'll do that. But Thankfully, I, I didn't have to. Um, God just provided a lot of people who were generous here on the ground. So, God, like I said, God has been so good. God has been so faithful. Um, 
And and that's not to denigrate any other church planters come here. I mean, Boulder is known as a graveyard of church plants. So mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of people we've seen about 50 come over the last 20 years. Um, and it just hasn't worked out for them. It hasn't been the right time wow. for them or whatever. 50. So, uh, wow. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of need. So I don't, I don't blame them for coming. I, I want more t- good churches in Boulder. Uh, and I, I'm not really particular on what kind other than that they preach the gospel and believe the Bible. You yeah. want to come plant a Presbyterian church, an Anglican church, a Baptist church, not a nom. If you stand on the word of God and you preach the Bible, come on in. There's lots of opportunity. Yeah. Wow. What, what's the size of Boulder population wise? Yeah, so it's an interesting town. It's 130,000 people. Um, okay. In the county, there's 300,000 people. And the reason I highlight the county is because a lot of people commute in. About The population changes about, about 50,000 every day because of commuting. Oh, and wow. so a lot of people work in Boulder but live in the county. Yeah. Um, and so it's a college town. They've designed it so it has a green belt. It's kind of like California where there's a lot of towns that are either butt up against the ocean or the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, the, the city and the county designated a lot of the land uh, surrounding boulder as open space so you can't develop it and so the property values just keep increasing Hmm. and it can't expand out or up they have height restrictions as well and so the single family home price in boulder the average is 1.4 million at this point so it's a very expensive town wow (laughs) yeah so it's one of the more expensive towns in in america um that's a big prohibitor for church planters as well as is the funding um so yeah, it's a, it's a college town, young town, average age is 31. Um, you know, one of the funny things is we're a fairly young church, but we kind of match the the demographics of our town. A lot of older Christians will be like, where are all the gray hair people at your church? And I'm like, dude, if you're gray haired and bolder and you're, you haven't found a church already, it's unlikely that you're going to come to the well and listen to some 30 something preach the gospel. I mean, there have been those people, thank God. Yeah, but uh, but it's it's not a it's not necessarily an older demographic. It, people typically leave leave Boulder to retire somewhere else. So it's a young town, college town, very fun, uh, lots going on. And we always joke that Denver is downstream from Boulder mm-hmm. because people go to college in Boulder, they move to Denver, and we've experienced that time and time again. You know, lots of turnover in a college town where people you get them for three four years, and then send them on their way. And so. Uh, so that, that creates a, a unique challenge in a college setting where it's limited population, you know, limited opportunity, and then people kind of being raised up in a church and sent out. And we always knew that it is an opportunity, but it's also a challenge to to constantly see that. And thankfully, we've had several families go to Denver, get kind of their feet settled, start a family, and then move back. So we've had we have seen that happen, but that hasn't been as much as people just leaving and then moving right. to Denver, wherever they're from. Um but it is a unique town and it has unique challenges in that sense. Yeah. No, that's great. I appreciate you sharing that. That's really helpful. I think a lot of people, you know, I, I'm, I'm only me, right? You're only you. But I think so much we kind of, whether it's whatever demographic or whatever subject, whether it's church, church planting, church history, theologians, or movie stars, or, you know, you name it, whatever, you know, startup businesses, we only know of certain things in our sphere, you know, it's always usually very narrow. And so I think of, you know, Acts 29, of course, I think of Mark Driscoll, I think most people do. And, you know, you know, about all these churches, or, you know, the big SBC churches, and of course, I'm in the SBC, but nobody's going to think of me when they think of the SBC, they'll think of, oh, Rick Warren's this or that, or right. Robert Jeffers down in Dallas, or, you know, somebody, somebody like that. Uh, First Baptist Atlanta, these these other churches. And you kind of, you don't really have, you know, we kind of gauge it. I think we even do that with politics and, you know, worldview and stuff. We're like, well, everybody kind of seems to think this, or this seems to be the direction. And it's like, is that though? You know, we don't really have right. a, a classic boots on the ground like you guys. You've been there for 13, 12 years uh, and you're, you're sharing real stuff. You know, families leave, they come, people you know, they go to college and they, maybe they come back, but they're, they're gone for a while or, or permanently, you know, housing prices and the turnover of church planters and just all sorts of stuff that it's everyday life. You know, yep. I've, it's, it's sometimes really boring and yet at the <laughs> yeah. same time we can see God, you know, I love the kind of the image of the rear view mirror. You see providence and grace. Then you're like, Oh, that's, that's why that's how that, Oh, I'm glad the Lord took that away. And yep. this door opened, et cetera. So we don't see it in the middle of it so often yeah um, it's hard to really really determine so i appreciate you sharing that that's good 
Um, we'll get to, yeah, you have a podcast as well. Um, and I'll put that in the description. It's a f- full proof theology. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. I, I listened to uh, one of your recent ones with uh, Oz Guinness, which was really helpful. Um, and I'll put all those descriptions in the description there for the audience. Um, all right. So you tweeted, let's go ahead and just, I'll just pull it up for the sake of, um, ease that way we won't people can actually get their eyes on it a little bit more but you tweeted about a week or so ago and it was something that kind of caught my eye uh more so than other tweets i'm not on twitter too terribly much but there was this here and uh so seventy five thousand views 114 retweets uh nothing cataclysmic but it was enough to say okay and i and i'd already listened to your your talk with um, John Harris, and uh, we're in a private chat as well for people who are listening. There's, I'm in a few of those with different people, and it's <laughs> nice. You kind of have that offline, the group meet, Discord, those types of things. Yeah. What's ours called? Di- uh, what is it? Uh, Signal. Signal. That's right. There is Signal. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of guys in there. Anyway, um, so you you put you said America has experienced a sudden and shocking rise in school shootings in the last 25 years. Right. This was just right after the Nashville shooting with the right with the the gal killing kids and adults crazy how are we to understand this rise gun ownership in america per capita was actually higher before these heinous acts began to be more common so how are we to explain it a brief thread and so the first couple you say from adultery to no fault divorce to reliance on government for provision the family has been relegated to the sidelines healthy and strong families make a strong and coherent social fabric with uh, counteracts the which counteracts the incredible loneliness many feel today. Fathers were designed to provide for their families. Masculinity has been denigrated and labeled as toxic. Strength and courage and hope are virtues and have been traded for vices of laziness, passivity, despair. Feminism has produced an awful culture. So it goes on. We'll get back to it. Um, what, 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 for lack of a better word, what prompted you to write that? I mean, I guess the Nashville shooting, was there anything else that's kind of on your mind that you're like, hey, I got to type this out? Yeah. So you have to understand my, in my context and my heart for the gospel and for teaching the Bible, um, when we move to Boulder, when you move in a place like Boulder, especially from a place that is more, you could call it more Christian, has a thicker Christian culture, thicker social cohesion. Mm-hmm. It challenges you to really know what you believe in a different way. Not that those beliefs shape are, are different, but that you have to provide an apologetic or an answer biblically or just culturally that is more substantive than, you know, just kind of common stuff you would hear like, well, the second amendment, you know, like, and, and we can make that, you know, I'm fine if you want to make that argument, but I wanted to provide a broader answer because for me in Boulder, this, this has always been kind of a, a topic, especially in a place like Colorado, you've got the history of Columbine, which was one of the first things who I know people who were there. I went to seminary with some, have some at our own school who uh, now they're parents and they have kids in school. And so this is a big concern of theirs. Yeah. You've got people in my own church who I'm trying to disciple and teach how to believe the truth and not just lies about self-protection. Uh, all these kind of things are, are biblical topics. It's stuff I've wrestled with as a Christian. When, and this, these were things in the church when I grew up and I would read the Sermon on the Mount. And then, you know, you talk about guns and self-defense. It, you can either conclude there's a contradiction Mm-hmm. These people are hypocrites and liars, or you can keep kind of asking good questions and trying to progress and understand and understanding our forefathers who came before us and how could they justify taking up arms against England, all this kind of stuff. So I was just, I was always unsatisfied with answers. And so this is stuff I've thought about for a while. So I was in one of those signal threads uh, that you talk about. And some of the guys were saying like, I think we need to address this. Mm-hmm. I think somebody needs to say something about it. And I was like, well, I can say something about it. It's not really that. What I'm suggesting is that I, that's what's funny about my t- tweets. I don't view them as that controversial, but apparently there some people interpret them as very spicy, very hot yeah. takey. And I'm just like, okay, like, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of sharing my thoughts on a public forum. But for this particular thread, I wanted to highlight certain things because issues are more complex than we typically uh, take into account. And there's more going on socioculturally and worldview issues that that people don't take into account and one of the biggest things that's going on in our our country and in the world i would say 
post COVID during COVID, even pre COVID is this kind of uh, this reality of loneliness that many people are experiencing where they've been locked in, isolated. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of tribalism right now. So people are, are very dissatisfied. Like I've been with, with leaders who they trusted six years ago. Um, and now they're not. And so they don't know who to listen to, who to look to. So anyways, I was like, loneliness is a big deal. Where is it coming from? What are some of the things that are contributing to loneliness? Because I think for a lot of these incidents, um, these heinous acts of evil and wickedness, uh, particularly against children where they're murdered, um, it's just terrible. And it, 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 I think it's a very simplistic and unsatisfying find answer to go you know, it's the gun's fault you know we we wouldn't say that about cars or any other thing or a knife is in a crime it's it's a human condition and obviously the human condition is sin the answer is the gospel and we we can look even culturally and say what's going on in our culture that has led to this rise of people feeling like this is a way that they have chosen to um to commit heinous acts of violence what what's leading to that and i think one of the yeah. primary things is a, is a disintegration of a, the the social cohesion of a of a you know use the phrase cultural christianity and a lot of people don't like cultural christianity but i can tell you coming from a place that was very thickly cultural christian in dallas texas um that that would be what we w would be preferable in terms of what we're trying to build and establish in a city and a town than kind of this neutral kind of pluralism um, yeah. because what neutral pluralism does is it just inevitably leads to loneliness and disintegration of culture so that's yeah. that's kind of what sparked the uh the thread yeah no that's good i mean i think that's really the root like you're saying with with loneliness if someone feels that there's no hope if, if you're lonely you're going to despair if you're despairing. I mean, it's what's the uh, episode one, episode two, Star Wars. I'm a big Star Wars guy, you know, and, and Yoda, you know, hate leads to the dark side. He's got like a little string of, you know, Yoda isms. Um, of course, I'm forgetting it, but it, it, it's it's, you know, this progression to this progression to this progression. And eventually you're going to go to the dark side. And of course, he's talking about, you know, little Anakin uh, who becomes, of course, Darth Vader. And it's like, yeah, no, duh. And but it, it seems to be. And I don't really know what the percentage is. We like to say it's half the country, half the country, half the country. I think two thirds of the country is conservative and red, to be honest, maybe more. I mean, you look at just voting and just an overall map. You know, if you're just strictly talking Republican, Democrat, um, overwhelmingly cities and urban areas, college towns are way more blue, whereas everything else is red. And it's like, well, we're talking about the mass swath of where people live and just overall geography it's probably 75, 80 percent, maybe more. Now, obviously, the population centers kind of will tip that. But if people are lonely, they're going to then despair. If they're in despair, they're going to have little hope. And if they're hopeless, then, well, might as well kill myself. But you know what? These people screwed me over before. These people harmed me. I'm going to go out with guns blazing, literally. And here we are. I mean, it's yeah. 325, 328, something like that. School shootings. I could be wrong on that number. But in the last two decades, two and a half years or two and a half decades, because uh, Columbine was, was it 98? Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Uh -huh. I remember when that happened and it was so, I mean, I was what, sophomore, a freshman in high school, something like that. And, you know, I'm in high school. I know I'm in California, but it was still such a this was shocking and crazy. And these people, these guys were loners and they were the trench coat mafia. I remember that whole thing. And of course, afterward you see guys in trench coats at school and you're like, Yikes. you know, you're yeah. freaked out. Rightfully so. Just like after nine 11, you see, you know, somebody who's, you know, a woman who's wearing a hijab or a Muslim guy, or you're on an airplane. You're like, Oh, you're going to blow it up. I mean, that's just our human reaction. you get attacked by a dog. You see any dog that looks mildly, you know, scary. You're going to be defensive. I mean, it's just, it's right. just human nature. Um, and so, you know, with the school shootings. And then I remember even in college, uh, Virginia Tech happened, which was, I don't know, lots of people. I mean, it was dozens of people. Uh, and that was, I think, 2007, 2008, something like that. I was, I was right there in college. And you just think, what is happening? You know, and there's been multiple other ones, you know, with movie theaters and schools and Christian schools and public schools and, or, and, and malls. And I mean, you name it. Um, it's just unbelievable. So I think the root, of course, isn't guns. I mean, that's such a simplistic answer. 
uh, that a lot of people give. And you just think that that's not the, that's not we all know that that's not the reason. You know, right. nobody blames, you know, spoons or, or fast food on people being fat, eating too much ice cream. Like you could eat ice cream with your hand. The, the point, if you want to eat ice cream, you want to eat cake, sugar in general, it's not going to you're not going to get stopped by not having a utensil. Right. right. <laughs> or whatever. You're going to steal it if you have to. And you don't have any money. I'll steal my ice cream. I mean, people do this with drugs. People do. I mean, ugh, it's crazy. Um, let's add this back here. We'll look at this a little bit more. The fourth. Let's see. Here it is. Yeah. So fourth uh, tweet. This is directly connected to the sexual revolution, which seeks to be liberated from any form. Oops. Uh, any form of masculine leadership and unchosen bonds. Much of what we're seeing is the fruit of sexual perversion, which gained a foothold in America through the sexual revolution. The world celebrates victimhood. If you identify as oppressed, you are given attention and told you are a hero. People who have raised, been raised in a culture via education and media, which tells them they should be a victim and should overthrow the order which made them a victim. Why is This is why liberation theology is poison. And we'll read this last one and we'll get back to it. Uh, there is profound disinterest in love of others and concern for the marginalized. The crazy thing is how some of the most wicked policies are painted over with the phrases, love your neighbor, quote unquote, policies which are pitched as caring, quote, are more often destructive to the poor. So again, flesh that out a little bit more. Uh, obviously that's, you know, it's it's hot buttony in one sense when, when you're so, when you have you know, you get a sunburn and everything's you know, super sensitive or you have you have sure. a scar and that part of your skin is still very sensitive. People seem to no longer have the three layers of skin physically or, or yeah, psychologically, emotionally. It's maybe one layer and it's burned. And so anything, even a glance or a brush up against someone, instantly they're reactionary. Right. So flesh that out a little bit more for us um, and, you know, just kind of walk us through that and we'll we'll continue. Yeah, so the way I'm trying to logically make the argument is that the sexual revolution, which is rooted in a perversion of nature, perversion of God's law, um, and really started much earlier than the 60s from the academy and kind of the Frankfurt School and all this, um, it's it, it leads to isolation, it leads to loneliness, it leads to an overthrowing of fatherhood and masculinity. Mm -hmm. It leads to social disintegration. It leads to the destruction of the family. A great example, if you ever want to watch it, is uh, What Killed Michael Brown. I think Shelby Steele did that movie. You can go find it. What killed Michael it Brown. And he talks about growing up in Chicago, I think it was, and how the government came with all these solutions in the 60s to make the family better, to help help the black community. And they ended up destroying the black community with social programs run by the government. And so we've seen this kind of rise since the 60s, particularly, but I would say it started before then, of kind of these ideas where the government can be dad, the government can provide for you, and we can outsource our responsibility and our, our, our need to take initiative to, to other third parties, and that will solve the problem. I mean, the typical example is if you go to a rally for refugees and you go and you ask those people that are at the rally who want the government to do something about it, Mm -hmm. Which you can you can make the argument that the government should do something about it, but my point is that uh, you go to those people at the rallies and go, "Cool, I have a sign up form, so you, people can house. Will you put your address down so we can send a refugee their way?" And immediately people are like, "No, I don't want right. to do that." And I've seen and, that too. And it's yeah, it's, man on the street, you know, guy yeah. on the microphone asking people, numerous yeah. people, and you're like, they don't want to do anything. And so I'm trying to connect it all. And I think it's I think I make a, a, a logical argument that's cohesive to where it's all it, it's very much connected to a broader cultural move that's rooted in a demonic perversion of God's ways that leads to isolation. Mm. And then you've got government coming along. I mean, think about Newsom in California suggesting that, you know, he's an abortion, whether it's an abortion sanctuary state or whatever, but like he put on an abortion billboard, love your neighbor, you know, and like, like it's, it's a complete perversion of God's word. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I'm trying to connect in that. At least that last piece is that a lot of the policies that a lot of young Christians have been told are caring and loving 
And because they've been raised in a very empathetic kind of victim culture, they're, they're hungry to understand how do we help these people? I mean, I see it every day in Boulder, man. I see people strung out on drugs, uh, broken in their mind, hurting, and a lot of people want to help. And I think that's a good thing that they want to help. But what, mm -hmm. what they typically do is they want to outsource it through taxes to the government and they don't want to help those people become uh, independent, you know, and take responsibility for their actions and ultimately, ultimately come to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Instead, we just love to, we love the idea, the virtue signaling of, you know, give more taxes and give more, give more things to them, whether it's an education problem, it's a housing problem, whatever it is. And it's like, dude, like that's not the underlying issue. A lot of the, even the talk about with this uh, shooter in Nashville, talking about transgenderism, talking about the mental brokenness that comes with, you know, looking at your own body and hating your creator and hating the fact that you're in it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's not just a mental issue. It's not just a mental disease. I think a lot of our talk about mental disease gets really problematic because we look, we look at the mental issues that come with that, which, you know, for any listener who doesn't know, 20 years ago, things like transgenderism would have been considered a disorder in the, in the kind of mental disease. Yeah. Uh, Maybe even 10 years ago. I mean, yeah. like in certain most sectors, I would, I would say I'm not an expert, but yeah, I would say so, but, but we outsourced a lot of our, as the church and pastors and Christians, we outsource a lot of what we should have been doing theologically and biblically by saying these aren't just mental issues. These are sin issues. These are brokenness issues. These are issues that are in need of repentance and need, we need to go back to the word and believe the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Instead, we've gone like, well, if we can just provide enough therapy, or if we can just affirm them, it, or people are desperate for any answer. And so my, my hope is that, look, the answer is in the word of God, and the answer is in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's where I'm trying to connect it to a lot of the care for the marginalized, social programs, government intrusion, disintegration of the family, sexual revolution. It, it's very much like sometimes, uh, if I can be honest for a second, sometimes the way my brain works, it feels like a conspiracy theorist. I think I have a lot of sympathy for the conspiracy theorists. I don't get a lot of them here in Boulder, or at least right wing. I get left wing conspiracy theorists, but not right wing. You know, I think a lot of <laughs> pastors had to deal with like whether it was QAnon or other stuff. And uh, I've always wanted to meet one of those people just so I can under like, I'm like, those people exist. I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with one just so I can see, see what's going on. But a lot of times with this stuff, for me, it's so clear. It's like, it's not, I, I feel like a conspiracy theorist in the sense that there's like this map on the wall that I can see. It's very mm -hmm. clear to me. It's very plain, um, but it's very much connected to broader sociocultural movements that are often wicked and that we need the word of God to be applied to. And so that's why I'm trying to connect it to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Um, I mean, the God of the world, the God of this world is blind to their eyes. I mean, obviously comes to mind. Uh, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I mean, it's something that if you if you harden, I mean, how many times are we told not to harden our hearts, um, whether it's in Hebrews or uh, throughout the Gospels or other places or come as a child. And and it really I mean, there really is a level of hardening that seems to go on. And oftentimes the Lord will harden as well. Uh, which means you're not hard to begin with, right? You're 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 at least somewhat receptive, or can be, or should be, uh, and and that of course puts in human responsibility and everything else. And it's good to want to help people. Uh, I found, <laughs> I won't get into it, but I found a, a blog from several years ago. I'm working on a, a writing project, and and it's um, more about leftist leftist progressive Christians, red letter Christians, that sort of thing. And I found one, and this girl, you know, it was 20 verses that. What was the title? Like 20 verses that says that Jesus is a, you know, a leftist, a left wing hippie yeah, or something like that. Sure. You know, and I'm like, all right, let's do this. You know, because like I'm, I'm just always like thinking and like digesting and wanting to, to develop yeah. an argument. It's just my own uh, person, I guess. That's why I do stuff like this. And, and so, you know, I got through the 20 verses. It took a little while. And like so many of them were just it's just so blatantly stupid and oh the GOP are this and they're against gay people and blah 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 and they just want to raise you know and help the rich and tax the poor and you know all this nonsense and you're like what do you even you don't even have an argument you're just you're a bitter leftist democrat who hates truth and yet this person's of course claiming to be a christian you know and yeah and, and i think if i could jump in there it is like i think what people miss is like 
I I was that in college. Like I I I did Shane Claiborne. I was doing all the stuff that that they would say they believe, and and so I went to seminary and I tried to get answers instead of instead of just believing those things. I was like, well, the, I'm young and probably not that smart, so I should probably <laughs> go study the history, study the tradition, and yeah. learn from people that are smarter. I remember the first time. It was the first move I made that where I became kind of self self confident uh, in God in God's word on these matters was when Occupy Wall Street happened. Yeah. Um, and I I saw the videos coming out from that, and I saw what what people believed. And trust me, I also was very disheartened by the collapse of the economy in two thousand eight two thousand nine. Yeah. So like I get their cries, and 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 I understand why they're upset. But their solutions and who they were trying to attack, I, I uh, so as Halloween in 2011, 2012, I dress as an Occupy Wall Street protester, because uh, <laughs> nice. it's just funny. It's funny to me. Yeah. Now I have great sympathy for what they want and what they're mad about, but I don't, I don't, I don't believe that, and I don't think that just like caving to them and just being like granting them so much room. Uh, like you're talking about with these red letter Christians and with these leftists, I don't think that that you kind of just entertaining their arguments as if they're just on their face legit. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a helpful way. And that's that doesn't hold any intellectual credence. I mean, that's not how we treat anybody else. We should treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to treat people with respect, we should take their, them seriously. And if we're going to take them seriously, we should provide them with serious answers. And so that's, that's, uh, that's just a little background. So people can know my heart, like a lot of this stuff, like, it's because I was dissatisfied. I get where they're coming from. Yeah, I just I disagree with them, and right. apparently that's not allowed today. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, dissent is is not allowed in a lot of circles. It seems like, which is so ironic. I mean, again, this is why I'm, I love history because you know you can learn so much from it. Whether it's just church history, secular history, you know, U.S. history, whatever. Um, you know, even in the '60s and '70s, I mean, it was all the liberals. All the all the Democrats, all they were all about free speech. It was US UC Berkeley there in California, and so many play free speech, free speech. Well, they were pushing against the man, who of course was more conservative, more white, more old, more straight, more this. I mean, even uh, the first homeschoolers in the sixties and seventies were hippies. They were leftists. They were people right. who may not be, you know, a um, biden type of leftist but they were more of a just bernie leftist you know they're just yeah. kind of out there and just you know leave me alone kind of like a libertarian but a, a liberal right and that's yep. and you know they didn't want the man teaching their kids well the man was by and large christian you know up through even the 80s in most areas maybe the 90s depending on where you are but today the public school is overwhelmingly godless and secular, right? It's overwhelmingly pagan. It's overwhelmingly run by a leftist government, even in the most conservative areas. Yep. And so it's it's completely switched. So, you know, our parents and grandparents who went to government schools and, you know, the 40s, 50s and 60s, it ain't the same, right? It's not your grandma's public school anymore. Right. And I think a lot of people are still naive to think that, which we could get into that. We won't. But um you know, stuff has changed significantly in the last 50, 60 years. And the solutions, like you're saying, what's the solution, right? I mean, I'm getting a little discussion with somebody online, you know, as an atheist, whatever, and she's bagging on, you know, g killing God and this, you know, the typical atheist arguments. I'm like, okay, so this same God, we'll just grant that for a moment. This same God sure. also offers redemption for sin, forgiveness, new life in Christ. And how, what's, what's a better alternative? What do right. you, what do you offer? And yep. it's been two or three tweets where this person hasn't answered. And it's like, what is better? What is better than Christ? What is better? You know, say all that stuff is heinous and terrible. Well, based on what though? Why right. is it wrong to go kill people? Why is it wrong to steal from people? If we're just animals, if we're just material, if we're just stuff, if it's all just power grabs, well then the Christian God, you should still worship because he's using his power and exerting this, this, and this. Right. Right. I mean, it's just their arguments fall flat. They use biblical ethics. I love, you know, Schaefer. He's one of my favorites. You know, people, he would say that people were planted firmly in midair with their feet. And they're just, they're just, they're on no foundation. They're just Correct. floating and they steal from a biblical worldview. They steal from the Ten Commandments. They steal from the Sermon on the Mount. And then they don't adhere to that to any other thing. 
And then they say, oh, you're wrong. You Christians, you conservative right wingers, blah, blah, blah. You know, you love the GOP. And how could you be a Republican and a Christian? And, you know, all this nonsense. You're like, I don't what? <laughs> like, I know. I know. And I think what's well, hard. And in my interview with Oz Guinness, he pointed this out. It's like, look, like, I'm not saying the GOP is awesome. I'm not, no, like, yeah, they're not. <laughs> they're not. So, like, I think a lot of people when when they hear me critique the left, they're like, "Oh, you must be a right winger." I'm like, if you're going to label me that, I guess I am. But I, like, that's I'm not over here like this big diehard Republican either. They're corrupt yeah. too. It's the yeah. uniparty. It's it's the the government, you know, control, and they all kind of scratch each other's backs. And so. uh yeah. So yeah, it's it can be very frustrating to to hear your point. It can be very frustrating to have these conversations because as soon as you critique one side, they think you're the other, and it's like, well, in some ways, yes, but in in some ways, definitely not. Um, yeah. And I really do want people to hear the heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news that Jesus is King, and God is God, and He has the authority to tell people how to live. And I think that's where a lot of pastors get in trouble is they don't they want to say, you know, Christian ways are better. They want to say what God's word said is best. But they'd never want to push push that to where it would it, it the gospel can be heard so clearly that God demands you worship Him. Yeah. God expects all people to obey His ways. It's yeah. not just Christians who who are expected to follow God. It's He He expects all people to follow Him because God's way. And it's not not a demand necessarily, although it is a duty and a responsibility we have because we've all failed and fallen short. But it's also an invitation because God's ways are better. Like God's ways are better for society. And I think there's a lot of people, there's low hanging fruit out there. We've seen this in Boulder, low hanging fruit where people are open. I mean, you look, you look at a figure like Jordan Peterson, who isn't a Christian yet, and he's very open. He's to close biblical. though. He seems he's so close. close. <laughs> he's so close, but he's, he's exploring. It was funny. I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were like, listen to Jordan Peterson, talk about Exodus. Exodus. And I'm like, I'm not going to listen to that. I mean, yeah. it would be interesting from a, a apologetic perspective, but I'm not going to, I don't want to hear uh, somebody who's not a Christian pontificate on it, even though I'm sure he has some interesting insights. But people like him, there's lots of people out there like that who see the craziness, who know that this this movement, the sexual revolution movement, uh, is is just jumping off a cliff into wickedness and not good for people. And so we have a huge opportunity if pastors would just speak clearly and just stand on the word of God, and they don't have to be mean about it. They don't have to be become some caricature. They just have to like be faithful and like yeah. represent God's ways. Yeah. And you said it earlier, just, just a moment ago. And I I've been more that way too, or, or repeating it more is, is Christ is better. The gospel is better. God's way is better. Being filled with the spirit is better. Um, it's better. And I think I know, I don't think I know we've lost that in the last couple of decades. And does that fold in with, school shootings does that fold in with oh i guess we just need to obey the government we're not sure what to do you know romans 13 and so we shut down for not just a few weeks or a couple months maybe but a year two years some churches right. were barely just opened you know in in 2023 for goodness sakes and you're like are you psycho like <laughs> right have you not been paying attention like most of the stuff they said was just utter lies and the hypocrisy and the contradictions like come on right. people like march and april and may in 2020 sure we're all like you know, chickens with our heads cut off, not sure what's going on. But right. even by mid 2020, most people who are want to know what's going on and paying attention, it's like, yeah, this isn't them. Nah, mm, nah, you said this and now you said this. They right. both can't be true. Right. <laughs> yep. That's, that's, yeah, that's a whole nother show, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah. God's ways are better. And I, we need to recapture that as, as, as pastors, as uh, moms, as dads, as random, you know, job workers, whether you're a businessman or landscaper or stay at home mom, whatever God's ways are better. And we've, we've believed the lie for too long that, that we, this is just one option. You know, there's the religion. Everybody needs a religion. So you just kind of come up to the table. It's like a job fair and you pick the different, like, well, here's the Muslim one. That one looks kind of, they got some interesting things. And, you know, here's the, here's the Eastern one and here's the Christian one. And there's a few different flavors of a Christian. So you go this one, that one. And, okay. And then there's this kind of atheist one and you kind of be very intellectual. And this one takes a lot of effort. And, you know, there's these things and we don't think they're all the same. And it's yeah. like, that's nonsense. It is utter. I mean, that's blasphemous, really, if you think about it. No, and God, I agree. God is just, with every other God up in heaven. And we're all just like, I hope my team wins. Like, 
<laughs> yeah, this is why it frustrates me to no end when you have people like David French or others who suggest this kind of pluralism is good for people, is good mm -hmm. for society, that we should have kind of this buffet spirituality. I see that in Boulder all the time, you know, and mm -hmm. I see people, we've had people, there's the largest Buddhist university in America is called Naropa. It's here in Boulder. Um, so we have CU Boulder, but we also have Naropa. And I've always joked I want to go teach a, a Bible class there because they actually do, you know, religion classes. Um, yeah. Because uh, we've seen people, people saved out of Buddhism. We've, and we've seen a lot of people that come to Boulder for spiritual, you know, uh, they're on a spiritual journey or whatever. And we we see them hungry for more. And the one thing, the feedback we get most often from people who are not Christians who come to our church is there it, they appreciate so much that we're clear and we're honest about what we believe and we don't have to do that in a way that's you know bashing other people all this kind of stuff um it's just like hey this is what christians believe and this is what we're going to teach and we worship the living god and yeah. we want you to do that also and we want you to become a christian and they're like wow this is so refreshing rather than a lot of church plants that'll come into a secular context and it's like a show and it's like you know five life tips and they've got to be the next like you know, leadership guru, and they're going to bring in spiritual, they're going to bring in secular experts on mental health. And it's like, bro, like, you've been appointed by God to preach the word, yeah. preach the word. It's not complicated. Yeah. And you don't have to be the next rock star. You don't have to be, um, you know, these big names and big, evil. you can just like preach the Bible and just be up there, be humble, be, you can be as charitable as you want, but you, you got to be confident and courageous in Christ. And it doesn't take it, I just, it, it baffles me. It really, like, honestly, that, that I think that's what frustrates me a lot of times is it, it baffles me how hard it is, how pastors are tying themselves in knots to try mm -hmm. to please people. And I'm like, I don't get it. Like you got saved. Like if God can save you, what can't he do? Like get up there, preach the word, <laughs> be faithful. Like it's not hard stuff, man. Just not rocket science. You don't have to have the quippiest lines. You don't have to be pithy. Like just like we joked, this weekend, it's like, we could just get up there and read Romans 1. Like, you don't yeah. have to, like, for Easter, we're having Easter coming up. Like, great day. Like, very important day in the church calendar. Uh, it's what we preach every week. Christ crucified and mm -hmm. Christ risen. Um, but you don't have to, like, you don't have to do a show. Like, mm -hmm. you just don't have to. Just preach the word. Yeah. No, that's good. Let's read a little bit more of this uh, thread. I always want to say string. It's a thread. Although, I guess it's thread string. Kind of the yeah. same idea. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, th this is the eighth part. The internet fuels this crisis. People escape into online video games, pornography, uh, virtual experiences for synthetic connection with others because these connections are synthetic and fake. People are extremely dissatisfied and lonely. Fake relationships are not what we are made for social, uh, contagion via the internet only inflames this problem. Most public education begins from the starting point that our entire existence is a giant accident. That is key. It is no wonder that people flounder for purpose and lack an interest in virtue if nothing matters and they're told they're an accident. And then the 11th one, well, I'll put this in the description for everybody so they can all check it out because it's 18 parts. We'll just probably wrap up with this. It's a little here. long. Yeah, no, it's good though. I mean, like I said, it, it struck me and it was just like, we need to talk about this. Um, people know this lie and yet they live it. Living by lies never leads to healthy people and a flourishing society. Public education and the training of teachers in the universities with radical ideologies has been an incredible source of social disintegration. Yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, I think the, I mean, that's part of my own testimony. I've shared that, I think, somewhat, but um, before is, you know, I mean, I remember in sixth grade, you know, making a chart. It was a government school in California, Northern California. So it was okay, but it's still California in the 90s. Like, it's not good. <laughs> and, and you know, making the chart, and it was, it was like a history chart, you know, and I, I like to draw. I still, I still do it and um, artistic bone in my body, I guess. But, you know, I would do this, and I had Lucy, the missing link, and I had the Ice Age and all this other stuff. And it goes back, you know, millions of years. And I still remember thinking to myself, I didn't ask a lot of questions, unlike you. I do now as an adult because I feel like I'm, I'm uh, behind. But I, I always felt like an idiot. Uh, you don't know the answer, so but I'm not going to ask. But I remember thinking, but where do Adam and Eve fit in? Like, sure. I never not believed God. Of course, there's a creation. There must be a creator. But, like, maybe he used evolution. Maybe it was material. Maybe Big Bangs and something and this and you know, an accident. But God kind of used it, blah, blah, blah. 
I think all those arguments are utterly flawed. Uh, and that's part of my own testimony that my wife, she was my, uh, just a friend at that point, it's just 20 years ago, almost, um, gave me some, uh, CDs and it was a creation apologetics. And, you know, I could, oh, I can trust the Bible. Oh, I can, oh, that has an answer. There's this, there's this, there's this. And I began to understand that it's not an accident that God is the creator. And then by extension and more specifically, Jesus Christ is the creator. And he upholds all things. He didn't just wind it up and walk away, but he upholds it. He knows it. He's intimately connected with it. And thus his creatures, namely, you know, human beings. And that radically changes. And that changed me significantly uh, and and really drives my ministry still uh, because the world is, you know, godless. I mean, I just roll my eyes and my kids do too uh, when it's, oh, they found this blah, 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 said to be, you know, 14 million years old or 100 million years old. I'm like, no, it's not like <laughs> you, right. you weren't there. You have no idea. You're literally guessing, you know, that again, that's a whole other show. But that's such a good point when someone thinks they're an accident. What? So you're an accident. I, I guess anything I do doesn't really matter. Yeah. And it's a nihilist it matter. Yeah. yeah. It's just nihilism. It's it's complete uh hopelessness um yeah. and a lot of people are dissatisfied with it they're dissatisfied with the idea that they're just animals that you know have urges and sometimes that leads to some like that's that's not a so just pragmatically it's not good so socially it's not good for forming healthy people but then mm -hmm. biblically you know i've thought about this stuff too because we've had debates with with atheists on evolution and boulder and uh, i can have those and that's fine i can you know, I can swim in their waters and I, I have the resources to kind of go, uh, I've got the books on my shelf that I, if I needed to do some prep real quick, I could go talk about day age theory, micro versus macro evolution, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But like at this point, I'm trying to teach people like the word of God is good. I get sufficient. Mm -hmm. What did, what did people prior to the 20th century believe about the Bible? Because if you're saying that all these new inventions, all these new scientific discoveries um, would contradict the Bible and it's being used against you, you can go into that water with them and you can try to fight those fights. And that, you know, there's a place for that, I think. But I'm I'm more satisfied just going like, well, what does God's word say? And what did everyone believe over the 20th century? Yeah. Like, because right now the 20th century is not looking too hot. Like, it's just not <laughs> like what it yeah. produced, not looking too great. And I would say even, even back into the enlightenment. And so I think that it's good enough to me. The Bible is, is enough. It's just yeah. like, I'm, I'm going, and that, that is a, believe it or not, that, that, that conviction has only become more settled in my soul, in my mind. Whereas when I planted, when we planted the church, these things were things I was still wrestling through, which isn't necessarily great. That I'm not saying that is like, you know, that's, that's, an, that's a good thing when you plant a church to be unsettled on these matters, but it's just <laughs> natural progression of pastors and people as they mature. And I've just become more settled in the reality. Like when people make fun of six day creation, I'm like, I don't, like, it doesn't matter. Like it's in the Bible. So, yeah. you know, like I can, if you, if you want to talk about these other theories, I can do that with you. Right. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not that worked up. I, I don't need to like mount this whole, like I've got to prove the Bible uh, is, uh, you know, Bible versus science. That's a big thing in Boulder. Like people yeah. have a lot of questions and I can do that. I just like, Good. you know, Christians don't need to be scared of what they believe. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that goes hand in hand, or maybe it's the same thing with it's better. The Bible's better. God's way is better. Christ is better. He's better. And, and because of that, and I sometimes still fall into that trap in my own mind, you know, even reading that gal post from several years ago with the 20 verses that, you know, says Jesus is a liberal or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, you know, there's still part of me that whispers like, what if, what if you find that missing link, that thing yeah, that ruins yeah. your whole system, you know? And it's just like, I think a lot of people feel that way. It's might be similar with like evangelism. Like, well, I don't have all the answers. I don't, what if they ask this? It's awkward. I don't want to be awkward. I'll just, I'll just give them a gospel tract or I'll just won't do anything. And okay. Give them a gospel tract, but pray for them, engage with people. You don't need to be awkward either. Just have a conversation. But at the same time, there's this point of, I think so many people think we're we're on such thin ice that the Bible is has been disproven and there's this and like we've got these we, we're clinging on to scraps and I just don't want to let go of my scraps and if I listen to one more argument or one more debate or one more read one more secular book 
they're going to find something and it's going to blow it out of the water and I'm going to be devastated and God doesn't really exist. And oh no, Jesus isn't the way. And now my life is ruined. And it's like, you know how many people that's completely the opposite has happened. Right. <laughs> people yeah. go and search, you know, and they come back from that, you know, however long they're doing it. And they're a Christian because they never yeah. investigated. They never looked at, you know, Exodus 20 and says in six days, God made the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, you should have a Sabbath. I mean, it's, it's confirming in Genesis one literal direct six day normal creation, right? Like you said, and it's here. Oh, Exodus 20. I guess it is right. You know, I didn't really think about that, you know, or Jesus referencing Adam or, or Romans five, Adam and Moses and this and that. And going back and forth, you're like, oh, yeah, these are real people. I mean, oh, OK, like, of course, they're real people. Like how what they're imaginary, like what do right. you but you've been lied to for years. And there's this assumption that secularism this pluralistic thing is really true. And this Jesus flavor, you know, it's, it's helpful for certain things for certain people at certain times, but we've kind of grown up, you know, VBS Sunday school. We don't really do that anymore. So let's just do something else. It's like, it's, it's nonsense. So yep. anyway, um, you have anything else you want to add? Ch well, tell everybody where you, where they can find you, or if you want to add anything else uh, to this thread, I can, like I said, put this in the description for everybody to go check out. Um, any other thoughts on this? And then we can hear from where uh, people can find you. No, I think right at the end, I talk about, um, you know, people being depressed and lonely. And I, you know, it's just, it's really important today that we have an answer for people's pain. Mm -hmm. And the answer is Jesus Christ. And that may seem simplistic or unsatisfying, but it's our responsibility as Christian leaders to show them how Christ meets us in our loneliness. Loneliness was a pre-fall condition. Mm. Adam was lonely in the garden. So you feeling lonely isn't a problem for God. It's an invitation to connect with God, to connect with others. We are social creatures. And so if you're struggling, if you're lonely, go to church, get mm. in the word, connect with God, talk with others. Even what you just talked about, a lot of Christians are scared. Do not be scared to make a mistake. Uh, trust in the confidence of the gospel. That even in your stammering, you know, in your, you may, you may not be able to provide a sufficient answer and being able to say, you know what, I don't know, that's a good point. Like, these are all fine things to say, but mm -hmm. you can be confident as a Christian in God's word. Um, and so that's what, it, that's what I closed out the uh, thread with is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for all people, for all nations. That's where our country needs to go. That's where my state, my city needs to go. Our families need to go. And it starts with each one of us who are listening, taking responsibility uh, for their own questions, for our own souls before the Lord, and trusting God's salvation for our lives. Um, but yeah, for uh, for any yeah, kind of promo yeah. stuff, if people want to find, uh, you can go to Full Proof Theology. That's F-U-L-L, -L, Proof Theology. Um, that's on any podcast platform. My website is jchasedavis.com. I have a form there if you ever want to get in touch, ask any questions. Obviously, you can follow me on Twitter or not. If the takes are too spicy for you, um, <laughs> that's fine. And our church is boulderwell.org. Uh, it's called the Well Church after the woman at the well and John 4 and Jesus okay. meeting her there. Nice. And so those are just some uh, places people can connect. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, brother. Well, thank you for the time. Um, I really do I appreciate it. Like I said, it's, I hope this is helpful for a lot of people because again, we need to continue to have the conversations continue to, and then provide answers. And time and time again, do I hear the answer is it starts with us. Um, and that goes with, you know, it, it's, it's naked and exposed with the leftists who's, you know, about the refugee crisis and you go to them directly and say, okay, uh, we've got three refugees right here. Are you able to take one? Oh, I can't, you know, and, right. and, and yeah. automatically, personal responsibility goes out the window. And so yep. as Christians, followers of the truth, the way, the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be about personal responsibility. We need to be about the things that matter the most and, you know, being disciplined, getting up, you know, even you mentioned Jordan Peterson, make your bed, clean your room. Yeah. Uh, there's famous speeches out there for that, you know, and, and college commencement speeches and things and clean your room, do the dishes, do love your wife, love your husband, women, you know, uh, um, submit to your husband men love your wives lead them you know don't be lazy don't be a fool and a lot of it's boring you know we think it's needs to be sizzling and exciting and all this stuff and it's like it doesn't need to be so right anyway it starts with us this is helpful brother i appreciate it take care and god bless thank you